Good morning. Welcome to National Science Week at Queen Victoria Museum and Art Gallery. My name's David Maynard, and with me today is Dr Chris Maven from Hi, the University of Tasmania. We're going to be speaking to you today about the subject marine plants and their role they have in climate change. Please remember that uh, we'd love to hear some questions from you. Uh, we'll be answering questions at about 10.30. So to start, it, it seems uh, silly that in 2020 we still need to reiterate that climate change is real and it's created, caused by the emission of greenhouse gases, mainly from the burning of fossil fuels. And this is affecting all of human and natural systems. At the moment, a lot of governments are focusing on tackling uh, emissions as the way to solve climate change. But there's also a great need to look at ways to recapture that carbon. So to do that, one of the things we'll need to do is understand the carbon cycle. And as part of that, you, we already uh, understand the importance of uh, terrestrial plants in capturing that. But we're going to introduce you to blue carbon. And uh, to get this kicked off, we might hand over to Chris to talk about the um, green oh, sequestration. Sequestration. Thank you, David. And as, as David just alluded to there, sequestration is quite a, a large word. I think it's good, a good idea to start our conversation around sequestration and what it is. So um, you may have heard the term sequestration. You may not have heard the term, um, but I'm here to tell you what it's all about. Yep. So... There are, there are two types of sequestration we can really cover here. One's natural and the other one is unnatural or man-made. And the whole idea is it's about um, bringing the carbon from the atmosphere um, back into, into a, a, locking it up into either a biological form and then storing it away for long-term use. So naturally this process occurs, um, but also the reason why we have a need to do man-made sequestration is because we are also releasing carbon back into the atmosphere at unprecedented rates above natural, uh, natural levels. Um, and it is our duty and our role to bring it back down and re-sequester our carbon. That's right. All right. So it's firstly, to, I suppose the natural part of sequestration, that we need to understand um, one really simple thing that happens all around us, um, and that is... Um, the carbon the, cycle. The carbon cycle. Yeah. So if we could have the first slide up there, please. Yes. Okay, so here we have the carbon cycle. Um, it has mostly natural elements in it in this, in this image. So you can see here we have that um, pretty much everything on, on the earth is made up of carbon. Yep. Um, humans are made up of 18% carbon. That's 12% carbon atoms. So, so uh, sort of jumping ahead, we agree that carbon is essential to all life on Earth. It's not like it's all bad. Correct, yeah. Yes. Car carbon is what makes up... Makes up it's the excess of, emissions. A lot of the objects and things in the yeah. universe, including ourselves. So we have a process here where the carbon um, in, on planet Earth um, goes through a cycle, and that cycle um, includes the carbon goes through the biological material, such as the sheep and the humans and the, and the trees, and the carbon is then um, uh, is broken down and then released into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, what, what we do as humans is we are extracting um, some of those old biological materials that are held up in sediments um, and held up um, under the earth, and we extract those, um, we extract that carbon out of that um, out of that format, mm -hmm. and then we burn that and it enters, re-enters the atmosphere. So naturally we have a, a level of atmospheric carbon um, and within that um, it's usually plant material and, and biological materials that are, that are really the conduits for that cycle of from atmospheric back into the solid yep. elements. And uh, so we're going to talk about photosynthesis next, but... Just in the bottom right hand corner, it just it does say ocean uptake. That's what we're expanding on today, isn't it? That's right. So yeah, that's one thing I did miss there is that the atmospheric carbon is also readily taken up and absorbed into the oceans for organisms within the oceans to take up that uh, that carbon. All right. So there you go. So one of the foundation um, concepts around around this process 
uh, really important and key to our survival, but also key to this carbon cycle, is photosynthesis. So um, some of you are pretty much pretty sure 99.9% .9 of you have heard the term photosynthesis. Um, and this little diagram shows you a very, very simplistic um, illustration of how photosynthesis works. So plants are really important. They're our best friends. Um, what they do is they will take the energy from the sun and they will use the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere and they will absorb that into their leaves. At the same time, they take water um, up through their roots, through the soil. Uh, within that water as well are nutrients. That's one thing that's missing from this diagram is that, the, that they also need nutrients. Um, and the plants from those, from those elements, they produce glucose and sugar, which puts energy into their growth and reproduction. And they also emit oxygen from that as well. So they get the carbon atom and they um, create this magical process where the carbon dioxide is reformed and turned into water, energy and growth. And we, we can eat plants too and we can, we can consume that carbon. And so green carbon is that uh, part of the carbon that is locked up in all life forms. And so when you think of a forest, you've got massive amounts of carbon tied up. And the only way that will be released is when the plant dies and starts to decompose or is burnt. So we, uh, it is really good to have the land-based systems, but today we're gonna to talk about those marine-based systems, the blue carbon. So we might introduce a couple of those next. Yeah, so stepping away from the terrestrial systems of carbon capture, which it would be forestry, peatlands, wetlands, um, and other, other natural forms, um, we move into the oceans. The oceans, um, we don't really know, still don't know much about oceans and what they do um, as far as, uh, there's so many mysteries in the ocean. Mm. But one thing we do know is that the oceans absorb up to 25% of the available carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a fair whack. Mm. Yeah. Um, and in those oceans um, are organisms that photosynthesize, just like land plants. Um, they photosynthesize uh, and they're extremely important again. And probably um, I would argue, because I'm a marine scientist, that they are more important than terrestrial plants. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more, there are a lot more um, photosynthesizing organisms and there's a lot more photosynthesis going on in the oceans yeah. than there is on land. Right. So that's pretty much why I believe, <laughs> right, if, if I was to argue the point. Your bias is accepted. Um, but the term blue carbon um, relates back to the concept of green carbon, things on, on land that grow, the photosynthesizer are usually green. In the ocean, we have a couple of green things, but there's a whole bunch of other things. There's brown things, there's red things that photosynthesize as well. So really, um, at the moment, we're looking at the concept of blue carbon as as anything that's ocean-based that photosynthesizes and absorbs that carbon dioxide. Yeah. So coastal and marine. Yeah. We're, we're going to look at yes. uh, the intertidal zone as Definitely, well. Definitely, yeah, and coastal as well. So it's almost like we're suddenly realising, oh, the oceans are important and the coast is important in helping us combat climate change. All right. Well, we'll start off with uh, salt marshes. Uh, this here is a scene from our local estuary, the, the Tamar Estuary. Salt marsh and tidal marshes are inundated areas where the, as the tide comes in, inundation occurs and then they're drained again. These are really important, really uh, good carbon capture habitats. There's uh, many different plants that make up uh, salt marshes and uh, whether they be succulents or types of grasses. But this image here, unfortunately, shows the most common of the um, uh, salt marsh plants here in Tasmania, or in Tamar Estuary, sorry, which is rice grass. It's an introduced plant that uh, was initially brought into the estuary to help with um, channel forming. And it's quite good at that. It's actually a little bit too good and it's spread out of control. Uh, it, it ends up becoming a monoculture. It just excludes all other plants uh, without exception. What it is good at is capturing that carbon, uh, filtering the water and taking out uh, pollutants and excess nutrients. And it also binds up a lot of sediments. And as importantly as that, uh, heavy metals. We know that uh, every soft sediment has is bound to a heavy metal. And 
particularly here in our estuary, there has been industrialisation that has produced a lot of heavy metal pollutants and that we also get a lot through our stormwater systems. So, yeah, these uh, salt marshes and tidal uh, marshes are very important. In fact, uh, Australia has about one third of the world's tidal marshes and instead of trying to quantify uh, how much carbon they take up or what their carbon value is, I can actually put a, a dollar value on it because researchers have tried to work out this uh, number. Tidal marshes alone are considered to be worth nine, over $9 billion to the community. And that asset grows in value by $33 million a year. So maybe we should uh, learn to love our intertidal uh, salt marshes. I'll make one more point about this particular rice grass here. There has been... Uh, uh, you know, concern about whether we should try and remove it or not. Really, at this stage, it's become naturalised. It has so much carbon bound up in it. It has so many of these um, polluted sediments bound up. It would be remiss of us now to try and eradicate it. Uh, it could cause uh, considerable ecological damage. So here in our estuary, I think we need to learn to love this salt marsh plant. So... We'll move on now to mangroves, Chris. Mangroves? <clears throat> I do love mangroves. Um, there's none in Tasmania. Yeah. See what happens as the, uh, because they are tr mostly tropical temperate species. Tasmania is just a little bit too cold for mangroves. There are some in Victoria, which are globally, uh, globally the ones in Victoria on a global standard are uh, as far away from the equator as, as um, anywhere else on earth. So <clears throat> the mangroves, um, Usually occur on uh, muddy mud or mud flats um, on, on coast, and mangroves are also really important to to um, not just ecosystems and providing habitat for lots of important organisms, <clears throat> um, but for that fact also the economic importance of mangroves is quite substantial in that they, they provide nurseries for commercially important species um, where they occur. Um, there's been recently a huge amount of mangroves that have been cleared from those coastal zones because there's lots of conflict between human population growth and wanting to live by the ocean, mm. um, but also development on the coast as well. So I know in Southeast Asia they, they, um, they, they, they have a big prawning industry and it's much easier if there are no mangroves there because they just get in the way of, of the machinery. So they, they'll rip out the mangroves and put in prawn farms in there. The problem is then you, um, you have... Um, that mangroves also provide protection from storms and swell. Um, you're taking away a really important buffer um, from uh, from protecting your human communities from from storm damage and storm surges. So um, yeah, so mangroves are really important. Um, they they they're quite slow growing, um, but they still they hold and store a lot of carbon, not just in the actual mangroves themselves, but also in, uh, in the seaweeds and the other types of um, photosynthesizing organisms that they, that they provide other habitat for. Yeah. All right. And uh, one thing you mentioned there was the importance of mangroves as nursery areas. For, I think that's typical of nearly all of these habitats we're talking about now. They're, they're really important habitats <coughs> for uh, various species. It's not just yeah. about uh, their value to humans. Or foundation species. So if you think about, about a foundation species, is a species that its big population actually provides a foundation for an ecosystem. And if that, or if that species wasn't there, if that mangrove was totally removed, yep. the biodiversity would be would go from something quite highly biodiverse to something that's pretty denuded of life. Yeah. Yeah. So our next uh, uh, marine habitat is seagrass. Is anyone that tuned in yesterday and see this slide? It's one of my favourite. This is, again, from our local Tamar estuary. Uh, Seagrasses are, are, are really good at capturing carbon. The, the, the uh, seagrass bed there in the top of the screen, you can see that it's got a lot of green growth on it, but you can also see bare stems. And in amongst it too, you can see a number of different algae growing, mostly brown algae. Just uh, so you, you appreciate the diversity, there's another two species there. Down in the bottom left, there's Holophila, that grows in a bit deeper water. Uh, and then mid-bottom mid is uh, Posidonia. It grows in shallower water 
and uh, can even uh, survive as is shown here at the uh, low tide mark and can sometimes be exposed, but it seems to be able to survive that short exposure. With the top image there, the, the bare branches, uh, that's indicative of leaf shedding. And so you can see in the bottom uh, right corner there where I've zoomed in on one of the branches, the leaves aren't all green. What's happened there is they're being covered in epifauna and epiflora until the photosynthesis uh, is just not possible. And so what the plant does is retract nutrients and shed those old leaves. And those leaves are now a form of organic carbon. And they will be either uh, taken up, mixed into the sediments, or maybe they'll move offshore, eventually making it through to the deeper oceans. Or in the case of our estuary, a lot of it will get washed up onto the foreshore as rack. And I don't know, some, I don't know whether you've ever been tortured with it, but a lot of kids get end up having to dig it for grandpa for their garden because it's yeah. such a great <laughs> carbon and nutrient source. So there you go. Seagrass beds are also an important carbon capture uh, species or group, group of plants. We've got about six species here in Tasmania. So we're very lucky. They're beautiful species as well. I've been diving amongst them. and yeah. You've and done some diving amongst them as well, David? Yep. Uh, very diverse uh, from green lip abalone because they're on the rocks in amongst seagrass algae through to all your different fish. In fact, there's a, a, a female uh, wrasse in the background top left there. Uh, wherever you go through these, you'll see many different mollusks, uh, worms. They have a lot of epifauna like bryozoans and sponges. And bryozoans are my yeah, favourite. Got to love the bryozoan. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So the next we're looking at is uh, our macroalgae. Okay, this is my, my specialty. I do, I do love diving amongst the kelp forests. Um, haven't done it for a while, but um, I, I did a lot of it during my, my research into, into kelp ecology. So um, the main thing about, uh, about what we're looking at here is that we have these really diverse uh, habitats. That, and as I mentioned before, kelp is a foundation species. Um, some people refer to them as ecosystem engineers because they do. They, the, their presence alone is enough to engineer an ecosystem to turn it into something totally different. Um, without the kelp, we'd have just bare rocky, um, rocky outcrops um, on, our, on our rocky reefs in the temperate zone. So one thing, have you, have you ever heard of the, the, um, the Great Southern Reef, Dave? I have. I'm lucky yeah. enough to understand <laughs> that it exists. Everyone just thinks of the Great Barrier Reef. But we've yeah, got our own. yeah. So this is we've got our own Great Barrier Reef in the south. Um, so the Great Barrier Reef um, is a, you associate with corals and lots of fish, lots of colours, lots of diversity. Um, and as you can attest to, Dave, all of your tropical di sorry, all of your tropical diving um, versus your temperate diving, mm. can you compare the two? Uh, oh, sure, tropical's pretty and it's warm. You don't need as big a wetsuit, but uh, southern diving's uh, just brilliant. It's um, and probably. Yeah. as diverse, uh, very yeah. different habitat, but yep. just, so, just as important and valued. Yep, so it's, it's as good as, if not better. So the idea here is that we do have a, um, a reef that does, that does um, is, is it almost equal to the Great Barrier Reef in its importance, um, and scientists have just started to uh, put together uh, how much the reef the Great Southern Reef is worth. So they've identified the Great Southern Reef. If we can have the slide, please. Uh, we're going is to jump one? ahead. Oh, actually, no, we didn't have the slide. No, we didn't that's put that right. one in, Chris, because we've only right. got half an hour to talk yeah, about okay. that project. For sure. <laughs> so, so from around Perth all the way up to Brisbane, we have these rocky, um, temperate rocky reefs, and they're dominated by kelp, and they're dominated by um, associated seaweed communities. And they're really important. They photosynthesise. They're, they're highly productive environments. They provide habitat. Um, they provide habitat for, for organisms that we farm. So rock lobster is worth $375 million to the Tasmanian economy. Without seaweeds, we wouldn't have that. That's right. um, abalone is worth probably about half that. Mm. Um, that's really important too um, for fishermen. But also people come diving. They come to Tasmania yeah. and they go around those coastlines, southern Australia, to dive, and we're renowned for having the most biodiverse marine habitats in the world. Um, we refer to it as a biodiversity hotspot, particularly in the southeast where we are. Um, the the other issue is we also we're also a, a, an ocean warming hotspot as well. Mm, yeah, and that will affect uh, some of the growth of some algae, 
uh, and then effectively their carbon capture possibilities. Yeah, they're not here. exactly. So, so they, they capture a lot of carbon um, and th they also provide really important services and they're really beneficial to our economy. Yeah. So I might just jump in there with the images you're looking at. Uh, on the right-hand side, Chris has got um, a great photo of a species called uh, Eclonia. Sorry, haven't been, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, and as you keep saying, you can see the number of different organisms that are associated that we, you've got either, is it either bryozoans or a red algae underneath. Uh, down in the bottom left is a really thick uh, algal bed of brown, green, red algae here in the Tamar. And the other one that we, you might have already heard and you'll hear more of soon is Macrocystis or the giant kelp up in the top left there. Uh, that's a really important habitat type. Do you want to talk to that one specifically? Um, yeah, so in Tasmania, that giant kelp that you see, the majestic forests that, that are adorn all diving um, marketing materials for Tasmania, 95% uh, of that habitat has, has disappeared since the 1960s. So we only have a few remnant patches um, and it's quite concerning. It's actually um, a critically, it's a critical habitat um, as, as defined by, by law. Yeah. So but, also, but also, like in terms of carbon capture, that's one of the quickest growing plants that we know of. Yes, yeah, so it captures yeah, carbon on. very, very quickly. Yeah, yet a um, lot of it's disappeared, so yeah. we've lost that capacity there. That's right, yeah. yeah. All right, we might move on. Uh, so where do we get to? Oh, I was going to talk to you about what we call a biological pump. So if you think of the wider ocean, the uh, photosynthesis, as Chris has already mentioned, is... Uh, takes place via phyto, phytoplankton. The, these are single-celled, mostly single-celled plants. They have a short lifespan. They, they're very good at capturing carbon. Uh, then they may die quickly, or they may be eaten by other animals, like here we've got the zooplankton, a slightly larger uh, organism. If the plant dies, it may start to uh, drift down through the water column. If it's eaten at some stage, it will enter the food chain. But eventually, somehow, some of that carbon that has been taken up by originally by the phytoplankton will make it into the deep oceans. And in crude terms, once that carbon uh, gets passed around 1,000 metres, it's sort of removed from the carbon cycle. It could be down there for thousands of years. There are some uh, caveats to that. For instance, cold water upwellings, which is where deep water is currents push water against the land masses, and then that cold nutrient rich waters re, re um, brought back into the system. But once it's below 1,000 metres, it could be out of there. Once it's into the sediments, it could be tied up for millions of years and maybe um, eventually become its own fossil fuel yet again. So that's the biological pump. That's basically nature trying to uh, remove that carbon in the blue carbon uh, cycle. The one of the this to to drive this, you need the carbon dioxide. You also need the sunlight and the nutrients. You need your uh, nitrates, nit nitrogen. Sorry. Yep. You need phosphorus, and there's other elements like. Uh, uh, elements like uh, iron, okay, so that's all good, but there seems to be a, a shortage of iron in the oceans in the current climate cycle. So I've, I've got this question for Chris because I know he doesn't like the answer. Can we go out and <laughs> seed the oceans with iron so that we sort of uh, turbo boost uh, phytoplankton production and so the, the capture of carbon? That's a, that's a good question, David. And when, when, you, when you do logically think about this, it sounds like a, a great idea. Um, the only issue is that we don't know what the consequences are. That's the first one. So no real research or thought has been put into what, what are the implications, what are the, what are the knock-on implications. So when humans tend to play or toy with something natural, um, there's always unintended consequences and they're usually negative um, that's one argument against it. <laughs> the other thing is, have you heard of, have you heard of, I'll ask you a question, have you heard of um, cloud seeding? I have heard of cloud seeding. Does it work? 
Uh, no, it doesn't sound like it. Really yeah, works. in in theory and by logic, it sounds like it might. Yeah, maybe, but maybe small impact in a certain yeah, area. But if not, you think about a tiny human on a huge planet yeah. putting a little bit of iron in the ocean, right. how much impact is that really okay, going to have? Maybe. <laughs> maybe. And how much will it cost? Yeah, it maybe there's not a business or an environmental place <laughs> to do that. Okay, so um, they're the basic uh, habitat types, uh, mostly in the blue carbon cycle. Um, how are we going with those habitat types? I mean, I mean you've already mentioned we're losing mangroves. Yep. Um, anything else to comment about how they're faring under human? So domain? there's there's a number of pressures on these ecosystems, um, mostly to do with humans. Probably pretty much everything to do with humans. <laughs> um, so if I'm if we're talking about the seaweed habitats, the, the highly biodiverse habitats I, I mentioned before in Southeast Australia, um, we've got a real problem at the moment. Um, and some of those problems are obvious. We know we know that the oceans are warming. So high temperatures, our seaweeds don't like high temperatures. Mm. They simply just get to a point where the temperature's too high and they just they get wiped out. Yep. It's that pressure. As those temperatures rise and those seaweeds start to become a little bit you know, unhealthy and not, not as happy, you know, you've also got the cycle. So winter comes back, they spring back, and then summer comes again, it's a little bit warmer. Mm. You've also got... Um, other other pressures going on, such as um, there, there is a uh, a long spine sea urchin. It's a long spine sea urchin. Do you want to flash that up? Flash this one up. Yeah. Could we uh, put the slides up? So um, the long spine sea urchin. So firstly, we have here just a really simple example um, about how sort of looking at how those warm waters are coming down every summer to Tasmania. So it's it's basically accepted that the East Australian current is pushing down further and stronger each year. Um, yeah, yeah, more or less, yes. Yeah. So th th there are more incidents of warmer water. There's less incidence of cooler nutrient-rich water. Yeah. So the seaweed habitats that have depended on that cycle, the annual cycle, are now getting less nutrients and warmer water, and they're not happy. And that's why we've seen probably a 95% reduction in the giant kelp population. And, and that water that's coming down is like a, a larval soup yes. of subtropical species. <clears throat> exactly. And yeah. so a body of water that's off Sydney can be off northeast Tasmania in about seven days. Yeah. Normally, under uh, our old climate conditions, a lot of those larvae might not survive. Yeah, that, that's right, so Dave. Here's, so, here's our problem. So here we have the long spine sea urchin. So the larval stage, so the really the, the microscopic baby stage of, of these organisms couldn't survive Tasmanian water temperatures, but because our minimum temperatures are increasing. Um, they've managed to get a foothold. In the 80s, we saw the first evidence of some long spine sea urchins. Um, and as as time went on, now we've got these huge areas of, uh, of we've got urchin barrens. So they come in, they munch all, all the kelp. Love the animation. Um, <laughs> and those beautiful forests that were once majestic habitats where you could go diving, which we had pretty much the whole of Tassie was surrounded mm. by these yeah. beautiful kelp forests, um, have been decimated by the increasing heat and also the pressure from these long spine sea urchins. Now, don't mistake in the native sea urchins for yep. the long spine sea urchins. I've heard people going out and killing the native urchins because they think they're destroying the kelp forest. Don't do that at no, all. No. Make sure, just don't kill anything unless you know what you're doing. Okay? So, so if, again, we've already said it earlier, the, the loss of these forests is a great loss to carbon capture. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay, so I'm just conscious of the time. Um, if we wanted to uh, say we lost salt marshes and we wanted to uh, do some remediation, we might um, spend a lot of money doing that. Yeah. But research shows it could take about 100 years before that would be as effective at carbon capture as the natural system. So the best thing to do would be not to lose it in the first place, I guess. Yeah, yeah, just keep it. All right. So um, let's just quickly talk about some alternative uses for uh, marine plants in uh, capturing carbon. Did you want to start? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. So there's um, there are there are ways we can use these photosynthesizing organisms for human applications that also benefit and and increase the amount of carbon we're capturing. So we have um, things like bioremediation. That's where your your um, your planting algae out into the environment in places where you have lots of nutrient runoff. And what that, that will do is that will absorb those excess nutrients. Um, and in that process, well, they'll absorb carbon dioxide as well. So we're taking the carbon out of the atmosphere that way. 
Um, there and, are other... And then so that bioremediation, the algal product that you've produced can then be used as, say, a biofuel... Exactly, or it can yeah. be used as a food in aquaculture. Yeah, um, so it's a very dust, it's a it's a very young industry, but right now there are efforts, some very very strong um, and persistent and consistent efforts to try and figure out ways of using the, this biomass we produce from carbon capture, using it in applications like biofuels, mm. um, using it using it in aquaculture feeds, yeah, um, and, and 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 other. Other magical applications yeah, well, like bioplastics. Um, but yeah, so there's also product replacement. And I wanted to, before you just mention a couple of new products, I wanted to show you a very old product. This here, I know it's a bit small for the TV, but this is a Aboriginal water carrier. Uh, these have been made for uh, millennia by the Indigenous people. And it's made of bull kelp, which grows around our coastline. It's a very hard, hardy plant. Um, being able to put up with our surge and wave action. But once it's formed, uh, and it's normally quite a pliable object, uh, product, once it's formed, it's pretty much as hard as plastic. So maybe we could learn a thing or two from the Indigenous people about how we can better use some of our native products. Yeah, exactly. So that's really good. Really so good that could that. replace plastics, but there are other yep. um, man-made methods of using plants in that yep. type. Yeah. Um, and I'll also add to that as well. So there's other there are other applications for um, I suppose when you're looking at microalgae that produce really important omega threes and, and nutrients. They form them naturally, and we we go down to the Southern Ocean and harvest krill mm. for krill oil tablets and other applications. Um, we don't need to do that if we if we can figure out a way of growing the algae that those krill eat and get the nutrients out of the algae that way. Yep. Um, we can reduce our fishing effort, reduce our impact on the environment. Leave the food for the whales. Yeah, yeah. Uh, save the whales. <laughs> and um, yeah. and, and then, of course, um, don't forget food. I mean, we already eat a lot of algae in our diet. Uh, we all have a bit of sushi. Uh, what about uh, your your carrageenan and the uh, agars? Yeah. So so uh, yeah, carrageenan and agars are used in toothpastes and and ice creams and. Well, that kind of thing. So, and the other thing as well, agar is a really good substitute for for gelatin, which means you don't have to you don't have to extract the gelatin from the cow's hooves or mm. the calves' hooves. Kill baby cows to get the gelatin. You, yeah, I wouldn't you have can, thought. Yeah. You can get agar from um, from natural sources. Yeah, I may and, not ever eat jelly again. The, <laughs> and finally, uh, there's a really good initiative using a an algae called Asparagopsis. It's, uh, they're looking at putting it into the feed for cattle because it looks like it reduces methane production by cattle. So each year a cow can produce between 70 and 120 kilograms <coughs> of methane. That's quite a lot. And particularly That's since lot. there's 1.5 billion cattle on earth. So we could greatly reduce one of the other greatest greenhouse gases just by changing the diet of our cattle. Yep. Go algae. Go algae. All right. Well, I'm conscious of the time, so we might wind it up there. Thank you, Dr. Chris, for joining me. Thank you, Dave. Uh, just to uh, sign off here, it, and make sure you send us some questions, please. Uh, questions. Ta yep. Tackling emissions is the only half of the solution. We also have to look at how we better recapture carbon and the blue uh, carbon cycle looks like it's crucial to doing that. Humans are the biggest impediment to this, but we are also the solution. All right, let's have a look and see what questions we've got. Excuse me. Okay. Well, first, please tell us your location. I'm sorry. <laughs> right, we're in Tasmania at the bottom of the planet. Um, and we're in Launceston. Uh, Let's see. It's good to hear from uh, Leyland's Christian School up on the northwest coast of Tasmania. Hi, kids, 44 kids listening in. Thank you. Uh, are these plants indicative of our other rivers in the Tasmanian region or just the estuaries? So we are talking about estuaries here. Uh, river habitats are very different. Rivers, are, uh, by definition, are just a, a fresh waterway that flows towards the ocean, uh, they have a different suite of plants in them and we haven't tackled that here today. Whereas estuaries 
uh, are, are a tidal system. They're, they're a, a semi-enclosed body of water that has access at one end to the oceans. It's fed by fresh water at the other end. And so there's a change in salinity along its length. And that, that salinity or change, uh, levels of salinity dictate what lives where along an estuary. So we've only dealt with uh, those parts of the well, blue economy, the blue, uh, sorry, blue carbon cycle. How, off how far offshore do these kelps, uh, kelp areas grow and main marine plants usually found? Okay, so the kelp forests, um, it's not about how far offshore, it's about how deep you are. So it depends on their depth. So if you if you look at a contour diagram of, of, um, of the coastal environment, Tasmania, um, I'm not sure about depth of whichever species of kelp you're talking about, but I know that the macrocystis can, any, uh, the deepest is probably between 30 to 40 metres, I think, before the light mm. becomes so weak because um, light can't penetrate too far into the water yeah. column. So, so can I jump in there? Yeah. Because you're right, it's about the light and the water clarity then. So, so uh, if you're off the coast, you might have better water clarity and so plants can grow to a deeper water depth. However, if you're in the estuary like the Tamar, plants stop growing at about 17 metres water depth because the water's so murky or what we say is yep. turbid. And so once the plants stop growing, below that are yeah, these magnificent uh, invertebrate assemblages. So, yeah, the, it's not how far away from shore, it's how deep the water is. Yep. So the, the, key, to, yeah, the key to that um, question is really the, um, whereabouts can these organisms get enough light? That's the main... That's the main um, crux of the, yep. the question there, I think. Uh, there's another good one here about um, what are the differences, the main differences between the native and the introduced urchin? It would be good. Uh, well, the first thing is, uh, by name, the long-spined urchin is quite long and very, it, it, to the trained eye, it's obviously a different animal. But it is dangerous for, um, like you're saying, for the divers to go out and say, there's an urchin, it's bad, let's kill it, because yeah. we'd be doing something good for the environment. We don't want that. It would be good if I could uh, send uh, Irina out a photo of each of those so that um, uh, you could see exactly what those two look like. And so, Irina, if you wanted to send an email to me through QV Mag Inquiries, I'd be happy to provide that information for you. What animal life is dependent on the plants found around our estuaries? What kind of animals are in on living on our plants oh there's there's a oh, like I, I could i could sit here for the I'm, next i'm going to lead you because i am conscious of time okay what what about the cultural loss of uh mollusks because we've lost yeah giant kelp yep so at the moment there's um there's there's been a bit of talk about um the loss of these giant kelp um these giant kelp are also associated with these special types of um mollusks like marine snails and those marine snails we used um, have been used for for generations um, in indigenous um, jewelry in ne uh, necklaces. Um, not sure it would have been great to have an example of it here, but if you if you uh, Google it, I'm sure you'll find some really fine examples of these beautiful necklaces um, that have been made for uh, tens of thousands of yep. years. Um, at the moment now, they're finding that it's it's quite hard to find these shells now, and they're wondering, well, what's the link? Why is it that we can't find these shells? So to actually be able to practice that cultural um, activity of creating those necklaces, um, we act, we're, we're looking at, okay, well, people are starting to say, well, maybe it's because, you know, those shells survive on the kelp. Kelp's gone, the shells disappear. Yep. So, that, so shells are one thing and it has a flow-on effect from just the loss of that animal. I mean, it, it has impacts on that cultural practice, but also probably is a food source for other animals anyway. Yeah. There's a lot of different animals that would live on kelp, uh, whether it be mollusks or uh, things like sponges, bryozoans. A lot of these things, though, can't live there for very long because the plant's not stupid. It's going to try and, uh, once photosynthesis is reduced, it will shed those leaves or yep. uh, regenerate other parts somewhere else. Okay, so... Um, <coughs> How many species of kelp do we have in Tasmania? There are two, well, two native species. Yeah, you're talking giant kelp? And one invasive. So I'll, tell, I'll run you through them. There's, there's the Eclonia, which is the, the, the golden kelp or the 
They call it the common kelp. And we sometimes. have a photo of it with the long st stems there. The, yeah, the, yep. Yep. It looks like a forest floor. Um, and then there's the giant kelp, which is the, the majestic, nice big ones that you can mm. swim through. There is another type of um, seaweed that people refer to as a kelp. It's the davilia. It's that stuff that's on the intertidal, that really big, strong, leathery stuff that you see in the, in the high wash zones. Which is this was made of. Which davilia. is what that was yeah. made from. Um, that's not a true kelp. It's it's life. It's biology and it's life cycle. It, it does not define it as a kelp, okay. um, but it is called bull kelp. Yeah. So that's a that's a bit of a differentiation. And they use that in they they collect that bull kelp um, for um, for fertilizers in King Island. Yep. Um, at the moment, I'm sure there's some applications that no one's even thought of. So if there are any um, people at school out there who want to do science, do chemistry. And try and figure out what you can do with the bull kelp because I'm sure there's a million and one amazing applications that will put Tasmania firmly on the map again for innovation. So, and, of course, uh, that's just kelp, using that word, but in terms of uh, macro algaes, how many would there be? I don't know. Yeah. There's so many. I mean, There's, we, there's we, more than we even know. Yeah we, yeah, we just simply haven't discovered everything that's out there. We know very little about the oceans. Yep. And sorry, um, to take a step back, there was the other part, the the, no, the non-native kelp that we have in Tasmania. Oh, yes, sorry. Is undaria. Um, if you've had Japanese before or eaten a wakami salad, um, it is wakami, but it's called, it's, uh, the scientific name is undaria pinnatifida. Um, and that is an invasive species that scientists have thought would take over once it arrived in Tasmania. But for some reason it hasn't, and that's one one question that people are trying to answer at the moment. Okay. Uh, now, there was a good one from, here we go. Uh, what can we do to help the kelp forests? <laughs> help, what, help the kelp? Yeah, well, what could the, the community do? But then it's, it's very hard for individuals to maybe help kelp. Mm. But what can society do? Well, <clears throat> if we go back to our conclusion, a concluding statement there about reducing our emissions, mm. um, we really need to make sure that those water temperatures come down because... Water temperatures are really what's driving this this huge uh, disappearance of these kelp forests. That's one major thing. Um, the other thing as well, I think, is um, to 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 go in amongst it, do some do some scuba diving there, and just develop an appreciation because these are really amazing habitats. Yeah. And once you go in there and you see what what, what lives in there, you, you don't want to you, you don't want to go on a bushwalk ever again. No, <laughs> and, and and so that provides a, a higher care factor if you better understand that that plant that ecosystem so it is yeah. it is important to try and engage the broader community in, in that. yeah exactly and the I other think thing though that you might be able to quickly mention knowing that we've not got long uh the university is trying to uh help uh save the kelp yeah uh, can you comment on their work in yeah so so th there's a really good body of knowledge being built up about the biology and how the kelp behaves under climate change conditions. But now we're also looking at um, this, there's a few people who are um, looking at um, restoring those kelp forests. Um, they're getting this, because there seems to be a couple of stronger families of the giant kelp. So they're, they're looking at the genetics of these things, also looking at breeding, breeding the super versions of these kelps yep. so that they can, because some of them strangely withstand the temperatures um, that are that are that are occurring at the moment. So there's some yeah there's some really strong research going on in, in looking at how we can breed a super kelp um, that'll withstand the temperatures, but also you know th there are further applications. We, you can't just say we want to restore the kelp forests and that's it. Yep. You won't get any government funding. You have to say well because we want to try and create either a product um, or um, or we want to be able to to use it for bioremediation in aquaculture or something like that. Yeah, yeah. but it wouldn't it be good for all of Tasmania if we manage to bring back the kelp forest because it would help with those commercial fisheries. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's not just about saving the kelp, it's about filling a, a niche in our near shore environment. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And bringing back some of the species we've lost. All right. We have to stop, Chris. Do we, Dave? Yes. It's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are back tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Uh, Chris Arkless, uh, Christelle and Dr Martin George will be presenting a great session about the tides and the tidal energy. I hope you can enjoy uh, join us and thanks for being here today. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.